Good evening, everybody. I'm Pastor Jeffrey Phillips, Associate Pastor of Winneka Congregational Church. We welcome you to uh, self-care, uh, peace for the journey, self-care while caring for your parents. The first in a series of programs we're calling Impact 75, vital 75-minute conversations about issues that are encountered in everyday living. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of healing, a ministry of balance, encouraging people to take care of themselves in terms of their spirits, their bodies, their minds, and their relationships with one another. And we try to live that out today by encouraging that kind of balance, that kind of finding joy in living, finding mental health, mental wellness, and spiritual wellness in our everyday living. So these programs in PAC 75 will, each one will have a different focus, but each one will be about helping people to live well in their lives, despite all the challenges that we face because of the pandemic and because of all the other challenges that just come with being a human being. Tonight's program is about caring for your parents and caring for yourself while you're caring for your parents, if you happen to be in that situation. The program is being recorded and will be available on the Winneka Congregational Church YouTube page and in our church newsletter, The Messenger. So if anyone would like to view it that way, uh, you can always find it at our website, WinnekaCongregationalChurch.org. I'd like to introduce our presenter for the evening. Uh, by the way, before I do that, I'll mention that if anyone viewing uh, this session has an idea for a future Impact 75, a professionally resourced conversation about real life issues that people are facing today, uh, please reach out to me, Pastor Jeffrey Phillips at Winneka Congregational Church and you can find my information on our church website as well. We would love to hear from you about uh, programs that interest you and that would help, um, help you live a better life. And that would also be able to be accomplished in 75 minutes. Um, a low threshold, but high impact kind of program. So our presenter tonight comes to us uh, from the Samaricare Counseling Center. Winneka Congregational Church has a long-standing relationship with Samaricare. When we pastors at Winneka Congregational Church have um, need a resource, such as the resource we're using tonight, or a need for a referral for someone in our congregation who needs a support with mental health issues, we go first to Samaricare Counseling. Uh, we believe in their mission, which is to provide mental health care for people regardless of their ability to pay. Uh, the, the therapists that I know at Samaricare Counseling are all very well qualified and effective in their work. So uh, we're glad to continue that connection tonight. So our presenter tonight is Monica Gilo chartrand Monica has over 20 years of experience as a bilingual, that is Spanish and English licensed clinical social worker. She provides outpatient mental health services at Samaritare Counseling. In addition to traditional one-on-one -on -one counseling, Monica provides connections to community resources for seniors, group education on topics such as grief, depression, memory loss, et cetera, and support groups for those facing challenges such as being a caregiver. Originally from Uruguay, Monica holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Minnesota and is also a certified Imago. How do you, how do you pronounce that, Monica? Imago? You got it all good. All right, good. Imago relational therapist and certified supervisory leader in aging. She has worked in both administrative and clinical settings, including the faculty of the social work department at Metropolitan State University in Minnesota. Monica served two terms as district chair for the National Association of Social Workers, the Illinois chapter. She's a member of Imago Relational International, 
as well as its local chapter, Imago Chicago. She's also an active member of the Association for Senior S Services Providers in DuPage County and the American Society on Aging. Monica is currently serving as a board member for Age Guide. Monica enjoys nature, reading, spending time with people, and traveling. Her own experience as an immigrant has also informed her interests. So welcome, Monica, and uh, thank you for the preparation that I know you've already put into this program tonight. Uh, tell us about self-care while caring for your parents. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here, and hopefully our discussion will have an impact to people's life in people's life and um, really, really help them to say, yes, I can reach out. It's okay. I'm not alone. We're part of a community. Um, so I have a little PowerPoint, kind of a base PowerPoint, to share with you um, as kind of a starting point, and then we can go from there. Uh, please feel free, Jeffrey, to interrupt me, ask questions, uh, observations, notes, whatever you want to do, so we can really enrich in the conversation, and it's not just me, blah, 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 um, <laughs> and getting in the stratosphere of a million things that we can touch on, because again, we're talking about families, we're talking about communities, um, and that is part of who we are, right? So we can spend 10 hours in a row just touching the tip of the iceberg. Um, so again, this can lead us in many directions. So feel free if there is something that pops in your mind that you would like to deepen on uh, to ask and we can go from there if that makes sense. Um, so the intention of today's uh, invitation was to talk about peace for the journey, self-care while caring for your parents. Once again, the number one thing is that many times because it's part of our humanity, because it's part of our faith, because it's part of how we grew up. Caring is something that we do day in, day out, every minute of our life, and we don't even think about the emotional investment of that and what it means to us. Um, so we don't even recognize ourselves as caregivers, right? Um, so the first thing I'd like to know is to recognize that probably if you're listening to this, it's because there's a very high probability that you are a caregiver um, and recognize you because November, how appropriate to have this chat today is caregivers month. So excellent choice. November is caregivers month. There's a reason for that, okay? It's because it's a big job and needs to be recognized. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do with you is to have a very basic definition of what a caregiver Yes. So the definition of a caregiver that I'd like to present today, just for the sake of defining your role, is a family member or paid helper who regularly looks after a child or a sick, elderly, or disabled person. Family caregivers refer to family of origin, extended family, domestic partners, friends, or other individuals that support another person. Family provides 80% of the long-term care in the US. Most caregivers are women in their 40s and 50s. Many are sandwiched between children and parents, and some are spouses and are themselves elderly. So given that definition, um, I'd like to pick on a couple of concepts in there. Um, many times we think that a caregiver is somebody that comes from the outside, and is helping a certain group with certain tasks that the receiver, the care receiver cannot do. But even if you put it within a cultural frame, there are situations in which caregivers are family members that are doing their job, quote unquote, as a helper, right? Um, in terms of who is a family caregiver, I really want you to um, kind of, um, expand your mind about who that can be. So I'm just gonna give you a little example here. Um, I used to run a support group for Parkinson's caregivers, right? So we used to do like a kind of educational group first with the Parkinson's client or patient and the caregiver. And then we would divide to do a support group for the Parkinson's patient and the Parkinson's caregiver. 
And then in that caregiver group, there were a lot of spouses, makes sense. There were children or adult children, daughter or son. And then there was a lady that everybody, you know, when you introduce yourself in the group once a month, who are you kind of thing, um, she would say, I'm Debbie's friend. And this is Debbie's friend from church. So this was a church member, right? No relation to this person, blood relation, but there is a friendship going on. And this person was intrinsic in the care of Debbie, okay? So we really need to expand also how we perceive not only ourselves, but other people in the care of others. Um, and sometimes we tend to overlook it. So just to keep in mind that there is a very big frame of reference about who a caregiver is. May, um, may, may I add one quick thing there? Since you invited me to jump in, I'm jumping in now. Anytime, uh, anytime. So one, one situation in our congregation, is sometimes the caregiving isn't even done in the same geographical area. Yes, sir. So we have church members who are caring actively for parents who live out of state. Yes. Which yes. creates more complexity and, and challenge for them, not just how to do it, but also the emotional pressure on the adult child. Yes. who, in, in addition to feeling like knowing that they need to care for their parents, they have to, they can't actually even be there all the time with them. And they're flying back and forth. All the stress and strain of, of, uh, of the travel. Yes. yes. So you're, you're right. The care caregivers, um, th that definition is very broad. Yes. So... Uh, I'm going to expand on that if that's okay before I move yeah. on to other things because that's really important, a very important point. So there are kind of three dimensions that just come to mind by virtue of what you described. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. The logistic dimension or logistical dimension, the emotional. And then I'm going to separate it as technological issue, okay? That you can think, okay, it's logistic, but is different. So give me one second with that. So logistically, the loved one is needing assistance. Very often, um, adult children feel kind of the obligation to be there for them or support them or, or be known almost, right? So the parent doesn't feel abandoned. If we're talking about parents, if we're going just to that. Um, so logistically, yes, there is a lot of trial and tribulation because the care could be because there is a medical illness, it could be because there is a mental illness, or it could be simply a matter of mobility, right, or cognitive disability. So there are, again, different things to attend to that require different kind of assistance, right? So logistically, there needs to be an understanding not only of the availability of the care provider, but there needs to be an understanding of what kind of provision you're gonna give. And sometimes when we move to the emotional dimension of care, we feel this obligation to do everything and we can't, there's no way on earth we can't. And in that demand that we impose to ourselves as caregivers, sometimes we lose perspective that wait, I don't need to be the only one doing this, right? I can get my helpers there where my parent is and kind of identify resources that might be of assistance to the caregiver and the care receiver, right? So maybe there can be a neighbor there that they have been friends with that, you know, we can talk to and maybe they can run errands for them once a month right? When the person cannot get out because it's winter and they're going to fall. So it's also thinking about what our what are the resources we have, even when we're long distance. Then we're talking about the emotional toll, which is feelings of guilt, right? Feelings of being or not being good enough as a child, maybe issues of family of origin, right? Maybe that parent wasn't that great. Um, and then 
how do we shorten the distance, the emotional distance between that older person or sick person and the caregiver, right? And then we have technology. Look at what we're doing right now. There's a million ways that technology can be applied. And in a way, and I think COVID will jump up in this discussion more often than not, maybe, uh, because it has affected us all. And of course, in the area of caregiving, it's been a huge impact. Um, but one of the blessings of COVID has been putting ourselves in a situation of creativity where we kind of need to find more ways of being closer because that has been one of the greatest threats, isolation. That is a killer, okay? So people really needed to find a way of staying connected one way or the other. And I would like to point out, at least in my opinion, that there is a huge assumption that older adults cannot learn technology, cannot get access to devices, and that is absolutely not true. So we need to also challenge ourselves in the assumption that ah, they wouldn't know how to do that. They wouldn't be open to do that. Well, it's in the way that we propose things to, right? And with love and care, there's a lot of things that can happen, okay? And not only with love and care, but also with knowing resources. And I wanna touch on that later. Um, but there are so many resources out there and we don't know about them because we're not born knowing everything, right? Um, but my pledge to you is like, open your mind and open your heart to what is available because there's a lot available out there. Um, I mean, to me it's funny, but one of the funniest thing when the pandemic started, I see patients, outpatients. So this is my office. So they come to my office for therapy sessions, um, but then the pandemic hits and we're like, oops, how are we gonna do this? In my particular case, I was a therapist that continued coming to the office for those that wanted to be seen in person and also did telehealth, like a similar thing like we're doing right now. Um, so I was thinking, well, I see a lot of older adults. I don't know how this is gonna work for them, but this is my anecdotal piece. My assumption that, oh, they won't know how to do Zoom. They won't know how to connect on the computer. Not true. <laughs> the first response when I would kind of touch base with them and see how are we going to do this, it's like, oh, don't worry about it. We do cocktail parties all the time on Zoom. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay, I'm behind, right? So don't assume that people don't know things because we all have a lot of knowledge and we need to share that knowledge, okay? And another thing I figured out is that my whole scope of clients, because I don't work with children and adolescents, I work with adults, but I see a lot of people in the older adult category. Those were the ones that 90% kept on coming to the office, no matter what COVID was doing. Of course, with all the protocols needed, with the masks on. Why would you think, Jeffrey, that they were still coming to the office religiously? Just a wild guess. Because they needed the socialization. They needed the connection. That was the highlight of the week. Right? Yeah, right, very special. So, so important, so important. And sometimes we put again, a lot of burden on ourselves being a caregiver. And sometimes they don't need to go to assisted living, right? Sometimes they just need to have some community they can belong to and make that happen. Just give them a ride to church on Sunday and they will be incredibly thankful for it. And you're doing a huge favor to them. That's not small. So when you think of helping and being there and providing care, it doesn't need to be something completely complex, right? And very elaborated. It's just a connection, right? Knowing The person knowing that they are not alone. That's the mm -hmm. bottom line, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah, good. Um, so before we move on, do you have any other question or observation? Uh, no, uh, go go ahead. Okay, so uh, what the the other piece I have on that slide is that caring for another 
we care for ourselves or end in burnout and frustration. So again, it's not about the level of care we provide, it's our ability to provide it, okay? So many times we can feel very overburdened. In the definition of who's a caregiver, we were talking about people that are sandwiched in between generations, right? You have your children to take care of and you have your parents to take care of. How do you divide your energy and your time and your availability, right? So it's like the little story of the plane and the oxygen mask. You don't put it first on the child, you put it first on you, right? So self-care is not selfishness, it's care of self, right? And we need to really concentrate on that before we move on to taking care of somebody else. And sometimes we think, well, that's really difficult because I don't have time and I don't have energy and I don't have resources. Who's gonna take my kid to this and that? And who's gonna take my parent to this and that? Well, hold on, you can still do all that, but you can do practices that foster self-care. So, Uh, okay, uh, we don't have that in the big screen. There we go. So these are suggestions. Uh, so Monica, sorry. Uh, you can't see. see no. All right. All right. It's got to hit that share share button each time. Yeah. Okay. Let me escape here again. I'm gonna put. Uh, technology is a beautiful thing. Okay. Share screen. Here's my screen. All right. Duh. It's not the big screen. Start over. There it is. There it is. All right. So these are just simple suggestions uh, on ways to increase your self care. And once again, um, I'm going to assume that you guys are well-informed people, well-intended people, you pay attention, you learn from what you have around your world, and you may have heard about these things. The trick about these things is not that they are so hard to understand and so difficult to learn. The thing about these ways is that we need to practice them. And if we don't practice them with intention, they will not happen and they are not gonna be helpful, okay? So intention and attention to these tips is basic for your self-care. So prioritizing sleep, practice good sleep hygiene. And if anybody wonders what sleep hygiene means, it's just, okay, your routine to get yourself to having a restful sleep. Routines, that's what sleep hygiene is. By getting enough sleep each night, Resist the urge to stay up late, binge watching the latest Netflix show. And you may wonder, maybe one of you will think, oh yeah, but I need to watch Netflix so I can get distracted and ease my mind. Well, that's wonderful, but your priority is to prioritize sleep because we don't function well if we don't sleep enough. And we have more than enough distractions where that is an issue and it's, kind of an epidemic issue, the lack of sleep. Um, eat well. The food we eat affects our physical and emotional health. So make sure you eat a well-balanced diet. And I'm sure that, well, I'm not sure. I imagine that when you think about your loved one that you're caring for, that's one of your priorities. You need to make sure that they are eating what they need to eat, that they have enough calories, that you attend to their uh, hunger issues because sometimes when somebody we're caring for um, is depressed or has some kind of health issue that doesn't make eating enjoyable, um, they are not really taking care of that, but both of you need to take care of your balanced diet because if your diet is not balanced, then your energy level is gonna be affected. And again, we get into this vicious circle. Um, benefit from the physical activity of your choice. And I'm not asking you here to do four hours a week of cardio work. I'm talking about kind of more of a mindful 
uh, setting, like trying walking in a forest preserve as the leaves change color this fall. You can do it tomorrow or practice some yoga with online classes. This is another thing that I like to challenge. And that is that sometimes we believe that resources are there only if we can afford them. And that is not necessarily true. Uh, we have resources like AARP, very affordable annual fee. They have a million online classes for fitness for every difficulty level. That's just an example. So there's a lot of things we can do again if we open our mind to resources. Stay social, maintain your social connections by meeting up with family or friends for outdoor activities and or FaceTime those you haven't spoken to for a while. Connections, connections, connections. And also reach out for help. If you're experiencing feelings of anxiety or depression, you might consider therapy as a way to gain insight and develop coping strategies. Again, I want to demystify therapy. It's not for crazy people. None of us is crazy, okay? It's about taking care of your emotional balance. It's about not getting overwhelmed. It's about going to the basics of we are designed to be connected with each other. We're not designed to feel like we're in the middle of an island. So if you need to talk to somebody, that's okay. Go and talk to somebody that you trust. Doesn't need to be a therapist. It can be Pastor Jeffrey, right? It can be your really good neighbor that you have known for 40 years. Of course, somebody you trust. But it's okay. It's okay to get out of yourself. You don't need to do this alone. So, um, any questions or any? So, Monica, th this is, I think, one of your most important slides tonight because this session isn't about how you can help your parents. It's how you help yourself. So much, it's, how, it's how you start with yourself so you can be the, the healthiest, happiest human being you can be when you are serving as a caregiver giver to your parents. And those bullet points you just showed, those are some of the classics, but the cla they're called classics because they are tried they and true. They work. Yeah. And they work across cultures, they work across generations. May I be bold to add one more? Please, please. Um, in addition to being a pastor, I'm a spiritual director. And I have learned as someone who has a daily spiritual practice that that spiritual practice helps me be well inside and uh, better equipped to deal with everything that comes across my path, good and bad throughout the day, and more at peace, more calm, more equanimity, as the Buddhists say. Yes, yes. And, and less reactive to things that pop up during the day, including within myself. Yes. And you don't do a daily spiritual practice because of the benefits. You, you do it because of Connecting to the universe is who we are, <laughs> yes. but there are benefits uh, to a daily spiritual practice. And any Weneka Congregational Church member who's interested in learning some very simple, doable spiritual practices um, are free to reach out to me. And what I've learned is spiritual practices can be built into a busy person's day in a way that isn't just one more thing you have to do but it's actually something you look forward to because of the, the peace of mind that it gives you and the joy in living that it provides. Yes. Um, and as you're saying that, that's absolutely accurate. Um, and, and that's the point, right? When we're talking about self-care, it's self for you, that's self-explanatory, but it's not supposed to be a task. It's not supposed to be one more thing you need to do today. It's something to look forward to because once you have a taste of it, you want more because it really talks to your own neurological base, right? And to your faith, of course, right? To your faith system. 
Um, so as you were talking about all this, that reminded me of the concept of mindfulness. And you might have heard that from other sources, of course, because it's very much on. Um, but if I were to give you a very simple definition of mindfulness, it really aligns to what you're talking about spiritual yeah. practices, right? It, they, so, yeah, they are basically the same thing. Yes. So mindfulness, the idea of mindfulness, to be mindful is to be present with yourself, nobody else, yourself, in the here and now and non-judgmentally. So if you think about what you can achieve with being present for yourself, non-judgmentally, that's a big gift. And you need to give to yourself, right? You need to be important. You need to matter because otherwise you get lost in the shuffle and then life can get very complicated. So some ideas, in, and it's not in my um, PowerPoint actually, it's right here on my desk. Um, some supports for mindfulness, for everyday mindfulness. <laughs> Again, I'm not gonna tell you anything rocket science. Again, I'm gonna tell you something to do. No practice, no gain here. So one of those supports for mindfulness and for spiritual practices um, is to slow down. Just think about how your day went today. Most likely, if you're an active person, a caregiver, you have a life, you need to eat every day, so probably you work. And especially if you're in the sandwich generation, slow down. Slowing down doesn't mean don't do what you need to do. Slowing down doesn't mean, oh, I need to sacrifice this for this other thing. It means take two minutes of your life. Two, that's it, two. And just breathe. Right? Close your eyes. Walk down, up and down a corridor, whatever you are. Two minutes. It makes a huge difference in your day. Okay? And so, another, yes. Oh, well, I was going to mention about self-compassion here. Yes. Because on all those bullet points you listed, and with spiritual discipline, there are days that we'll miss. We'll overeat, we won't get enough sleep, we'll, we'll miss the opportunity for physical activity, we'll miss our five minutes of meditation or wh whatever we're doing. There are days when we won't do it. We need to learn that that's okay. It is okay. Give, your, give yourself grace, forgive yourself, be patient with yourself, be compassionate with yourself and say, Tomorrow I'll return and the returning will be joyful. Yes. Okay, go ahead. go ahead. You're the presenter, not me. <laughs> We're having a beautiful conversation. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, so, not that it has any connection with your talking, but another point that supports mindfulness, and again, is that awareness of self too, right? Mindfulness is also awareness of self. We don't think about this, but sometimes we need to be intent on talking less, okay? Just super quick example that just came through my mind right now. My last client today that I was talking to, she's an adult child and she has aging parents um, and very dependent parents, uh, but that has recently been diagnosed with dementia. So he's still functioning, but there are red flags that are starting to pop up in terms of safety, driving, and all that jazz that we will talk about too. Um, so family is starting to get very concerned, right? Very concerned. Daughter is noticing differences in relationship with these two loving parents that have been together for decades and decades, happily together. Now, there are things like that says to wife, um, I already told you this. My wife says, um, I no, I you didn't tell me X information. I did. And there is a huge discussion and mom gets teary and what is happening? Well, okay, that, that's the illness. We understand that. 
But now client is feeling all this responsibility that she needs to negotiate, that she needs to figure it out, that she needs to resolve their problems. Now the holidays are coming. Where are we gonna go? A big extended family, right? And there's all kind of communication lagging everywhere. So we finish our session and she looks at her phone that was bing, 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 bing <laughs> during the session. She didn't look at it, but she says, you see, I need to keep on going and I need to keep on talking. I just got eight very relevant emails to what I'm talking about right now in just this time. And it's like, okay, one, slow down. Nothing catastrophic is going to happen if you don't answer these emails immediately when you get to your car. Breathe. Number two, talk less. Find your core. Observe what is happening inside you. And then you can decide if you have the time, if you have the energy to respond to any of these emails today. Tomorrow is another day. But she was in this friend of mine of, I need to keep on going. No, no. Oxygen mask first, okay? When you can, do just one thing at a time. We are in a culture of multitasking. And if you don't do it 24 seven, you are behind. You're not behind. <laughs> You're not behind. You need to concentrate. You need to think. You need to reflect. Reflection is at the core. Part of a spiritual practice too. Very important. Don't forget to breathe. We don't even think about it, but that is affecting all our systems. When we're, <laughs> we're gonna collapse. And if you are a very involved caregiver that wants to be present for your loved one, you cannot afford that, right? So just saying, um, another thing that is very important is routines, routines, things that you can rely on, okay? And it can be totally tailored to your needs. So I'm not gonna tell you what to do with your routines, but remember that those help you have a sense of uncertainty, although the only certainty in life is uncertainty, right? And having tolerance to living in that space is part of your self-care too, okay? We don't know everything. We cannot do everything. So slow down, use your resources, look around and you're not alone, okay? Reach out. So before we move to the next slide, is there anything you would like to say? Move, move on, this is great. Awesome. As I mentioned at the very beginning, resources are galore. Initially, when we start this journey of caregiving, we're overwhelmed, we feel very vulnerable. We feel that a huge burden, and I'm saying that with love, is upon us because we feel responsible for our loved one. But when I'm talking about slow down, it's again, slow down to look around because there are many, many, many resources. So these are just a bunch of suggestions that I happen to like, and since I'm talking, I'm offering. Um, so I have a bunch of recommended readings. I have some websites and I have some organizations for you to reach out. Of course, I will not cover everybody's needs at all, but these are just starting points. So there is this beautiful book by uh, Thibault and Morgan that is called No Act of Love is Ever Wasted the spirituality of caring for persons with dementia. And again, if we're talking about dementia, that is a heavy duty opponent to our sense of balance, okay? Because in a sense, you're reinventing your relationship with your loved one. Because that person you have in front of you is the same person you love through your life. But that brain is processing information in a very different way and is decoding the world in a very different way. And therefore it's gonna, the person is gonna react in ways that we're not familiar with. And we're like, who is this person? And you may feel very out of place. 
So when you read this kind of bibliography, a lot of people feel like, wow, this was written for me. I never knew X, Y, Z, or I never thought this is possible. Wow, this really normalizes my situation. Huh, how would they know? This is what I'm going through. That's validation. And don't we need validation in terms of stress? So no act of love is ever wasted. The spirituality of caring for persons with dementia. Another one, and I love and adore my clients because they are such a wealth of information. And I have to confess a lot of this was given by my clients who are awesome. Um, this second book was given to me by a client that have, has an incredible sense of humor, incredible sense of humor. And it's such a curative factor for her, such a source of comfort, really. And with her husband that now, um, unfortunately, is very much declining in his health journey. Uh, he does have Parkinson's and he does have dementia. And she, need, she had to make the decision of care for him and believe it or not, care for her because it's all intertwined. Um, he is now in a care facility um, and uh, her and her husband really share that phenomenal sense of humor, but now she can't do it with him because she can hardly understand what he says, okay? And how are they connecting? She's writing love letters to him every time she visits. So it doesn't need to be like a manifesto, but she writes two or three paragraphs of love and he reads it and he gets it. And it's a beautiful love story. But she told me about this book. And again, really touching her fiber, her core about in all this terrible situation, there is light. There is something that we're still doing together. So the name of this book by Cullinan and Kelly is Final Gifts, Understanding the Special Awareness, Needs, and Communications of the Dying. Um, unfortunately, in this particular case I was sharing with you, he's in hospice, um, so the trajectory is not as hopeful as my client would like to know. But again, because of faith, because of the spiritual practices, she's relying on that support, okay, of talking to God, of knowing that God has her back. Um, so very, very important. Another important book is Untangling Alzheimer's, The Guide for Families and Professionals uh, by Dr. Cummings. And what is fantastic about that book is that a lot of issues that have to do with the day-to-day -day of sharing your life with somebody with Alzheimer's is kind of divided in chapters, right? And then this person, this author is really very talented in repeating information, but not in a way that you're saying, oh, I already read this, but connecting all those different dimension, dimensions for you to have kind of a holistic view of what is happening to your loved one. And then um, there's this author, Dr. Ken Truck, who's also a therapist, um, who has a blog, a podcast, books, everything in between. And he wrote this Racing and Aging Parent book which is phenomenal um, because there is something to be said about how the relationship with your parents change when you become a caregiver or when your parents age. You used to be the child and he or she used to be the parent. Well, yeah, we still have that title, right? But because of the situational environment that you're in as a caregiver, assuming that the parent is needing that care, kind of the table turns. And this parent that used to have the hierarchy and the name of being the matriarch or the patriarch, suddenly is not calling the shots, is not making decisions, is not managing his or her own money. Uh, somebody's paying the bills for them. He or she doesn't know when the doctor's appointment is, but I know my daughter knows. And she will call me the day before, so I'm getting ready when she picks me up, okay? So those dynamics change a lot, right? 
Yes. And that's a source of stress for the caregiver. Huge. I mean, that's that's what our program's about tonight. It's about recognizing that stress and some of the reasons for the stress and how to deal with them. But that's that's it's a very sad thing to have to raise your parent. Yeah. And it it can just it feels awful inside. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say more about that? Well, and I think when you feel awful, when you feel sad about the situation, just grieved, when you grieve how this, uh, how, how, how the world is turned upside down in your relationship with your parents, it's hard then to respond um, uh, constructively mm -hmm. and consistently and effectively because your mind and heart and body are caught in this grief. Yes, yes. But if you recognize it, which you're helping us do tonight, Monica, if you recognize it and say, that's why I feel so, so paralyzed, uh, it's because I, you know, I just am so sad about this situation. And my mom and dad used to be so active and so um, able to take care of their, everything. And now they can't. You recognize your own grief. Mm -hmm. And uh, that allows you then to, when you name something, right, you're able to um, own it, be it, and then move on. Yes, yes. And thank you for sharing that because that brings me uh, to share with you a concept that we don't consider very much. And that is the concept of ambiguous loss, okay? Mm. So for instance, when it happens to us all, right? Say our dad dies, okay? Well, dad died and you are mourning the death of your parents. So you know what you're doing and you're having a grief reaction. And again, grief doesn't have an expiration date and grief can happen to you in many, many, many ways. There is not a prescription on how you grieve, right? But it's a clear loss. Your dad is gone. You know, even though you might even dream about it or imagine that your dad is around the corner, right? And he's gonna come in as he did every day to have coffee with you, ain't happening, okay? You know that cognitively, right? And you deal with it, you deal with it. But ambiguous loss, is when you have this very concrete and real loss, but the person is still there. So for instance, when I was talking about untangling the mansion, and understanding it, and having a different relationship with this person that is not the person you used to know, while well, you're grieving the parents that you know, and yet your parent is right in front of you, your parent is not gone. So that ambiguous loss that is physically present, but mentally not, Wow, that adds another level of confusion and loss and grief. And is the phrase anticipatory loss too? I mean, you when you're caring for your parents and they are not well, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but you you know that this is they're going to they're going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And it's and it might get worse uh before that. Yeah. And that can compile uh that can put more anxiety upon your grief. And, um, it, but the key, the key of therapy is just to be aware of all these things that are going on inside of your heart and mind, right? Yes, and process them, process them. Process that them, are, that's the word, yeah. Yes, know that they are normal responses. Yeah. They are normal responses. You're not out of whack, you're not losing it. On right. the contrary, you might think you're losing it because it's very foreign to you being this, go get her but no what you're trying to do when you process all this grief is to find yourself again because you need to ground yourself in order to move forward right you can't just because then everything is discombobulated you don't know what you're doing you don't know where you're going you know you don't know where you're coming so so it's about you. being again it's about being gentle with yourself and recognizing that, oh, what I'm going through is a normal human response to this, this challenging situation. 
Yeah, giving giving yourself, giving yourself a break. Give yourself <laughs> for being human. <laughs> for being human, what a gift! Absolutely. And uh, as we're saying all this, I want to make a little point because I don't want to leave you with the impression that being a caregiver is all pain, or all work, or all difficult. Okay. There are a lot of blessings in caregiving. Okay. And I don't want to leave that on this side. Yeah, it's say more about that. Yes. Yeah. Because as caregivers, okay, we have a lot of demands on our time and our energy and our resources. We have a lot of demands on that. But because you're having more of a, a intimate relationship with the person that you take care of, you have such a great opportunity to know that person better, okay? In so many ways, you can know that person better. And I would dare to say that there is a lot of appreciation for what you do, that that person can give you in many different ways, in many different languages, right? Um, and it's there for us to take. It's not all about being on the treadmill every single day. They sometimes may allow us to slow down that we wouldn't do if it weren't because we just need to sit with somebody and hold their hand. And then all your endorphins are like, right? Blooming, giving you a good sense, okay? Um, just came to mind another client I worked with a couple of years ago. She was an older adult. She had a, an adult daughter in her 40s who had a chronic disease that was terminal, okay? So for almost eight months, she would travel almost 40 minutes or more, depending on traffic and the time of the day, to be with her daughter, make sure that everything that she needed medically was taken care of day in and day out and day in and day out. And of course, that was hard for her. She was in her 70s, okay? But she knew her daughter was going to go sooner than later, unfortunately. But in that exercise of being present with her, sometimes she would come to session and say, guess what we did? Finally, I convinced her to get on that wheelchair. We went down the 16 apartment floors on the elevator, and then we went out for a walk. And we had such a great time. It was a beautiful day. I saw her smiling. I was smiling inside. What a gift. What a gift. Another time she comes in and she's like, hey, do you know about that, ah, what is it, the British baking show on Netflix, I think it is? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, right. She's like, wow, we spent like five hours watching the show. And then I told her, do you mind if I go grocery shopping and we make whatever it was? And the daughter says, I would love that. And they had a party. That was their party, right? So caregiving is not just, uh, there can be joy. There can be joy and delight, joy and blessings. And blessings. you can find you can find to use spiritual language. You can find the holy and the divine in it. You can yes. But, yes. But again, it's about awareness, reflection, and saying it's okay, yes. and it's okay to feel that joy at this this intimacy too. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful point, Monica. Yes, I'm going to share with you a couple of videos on some very well-researched strategies, okay? Both for self-care and for connecting with your care recipient. Uh, what you see in that slide and kind of um, staying in the, in the theme of gratitude and um, uh, self-compassion, um, I wanted to share this little slide with you because that is the front page of a journal. Okay, and it's a company that does these journals. And this client I mentioned once about having this wonderful sense of humor, she brought it to me and she said, look what a friend gave me. And I thought, wow, that is fantastic. This is the attitude to have around caregiving. So what he says, because the letter is really getting small is, okay, fine, I'm grateful. A journal to catapult me from my default position 
of gripping and negativity to the long resisted stance of counting my blessings. Because it turns out that focusing on the positive actually might be better for my mind, body, and spirit in no small part because unhappiness is the gap between expectations and reality. <laughs> so even though this whole gratitude thing feels like a bandwagon on the woo-woo train, the fact <laughs> is that deep down, I'm ready to start looking at the roses rather than the thorns. And if you absolutely force me to admit it, I will say that in all actuality, I do have so very much to be grateful for. All right? Beautiful. Yes, it's a wonderful attitude. Because guess what? At the end of the day, we're all finite, right? And most likely you love the person that you're giving care to. And one day that person is not gonna be there. And all these are opportunities for joy too. It's not again, just work, 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 work. There is reward in what we're doing, okay? So going back to the video. Being a caregiver can bring out all kinds of emotions. One day it may be rewarding and fun, while the next it might be stressful and draining. It's a demanding job, and sometimes caregivers get so wrapped up in their duties that they start to neglect their own health and well-being. In this video, we'll teach you how to recognize some of the signs of caregiver burnout, and give you a few tips on what you can do to prevent it. On the best days, caregiving is empowering. It brings you closer to the person you're caring for, and provides you with a sense of purpose and inner strength. However, it's just as likely that being a caregiver will cause you to experience negative feelings. You might even feel several emotions at once. Scared about the future, angry about your situation, frustrated about your limitations, and anxious about all the things you need to do. The good news is, these feelings are all perfectly normal. The important thing is to recognize when they're happening and deal with them appropriately before they lead to a bigger problem, like caregiver burnout. So how can you tell whether what you're feeling is burnout or just normal exhaustion? Here are some of the symptoms to look for. You feel a strong urge to run and hide from your responsibility. Your activity becomes scattered and frantic. You often feel angry and irritable. You have a hard time concentrating and can't read more than three sentences at a time without losing focus. You often lose track of important details. You sleep less than three hours at a time or lose more than 10 pounds. Everyone gets exhausted once in a while, but it's the intensity and frequency of these symptoms that separates a normal reaction from burnout. If any of these symptoms describe how you feel most of the time, you should seek help from your family doctor as soon as possible. The best way to prevent burnout is to deal with your emotions as they come up. If you start to feel stressed, angry, guilty, or depressed, Take a moment to stop and think about why you're feeling this way. Acknowledge the source and try to move past it. Open yourself up to creating a give and take relationship with the person you're caring for. They may have as much to offer you as you have to offer them. You're both in this situation together, trying to do the best you can with the knowledge and skills you have. Don't expect the person you're caring for to change their entire personality but aim to find some common ground and work as a team. If you start to feel overwhelmed, try using one of the following techniques to help calm yourself down and ground you. Take a couple of long, deep breaths, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Count slowly down from 10. Trace your eyes along a vertical line from the ceiling to the floor, breathing out while you do so. Put on music by one of your favorite artists. Get some exercise. Any physical activity can help, whether it's stretching, playing sports, or just going for a brisk walk around the block. If you think you're starting to feel burned out, don't be afraid to ask for help. Isolating yourself when things get tough will only make your negative emotions get worse. Your friends and family want to help, but they won't know you need it unless you ask. You can't expect to provide proper care for someone else if you don't also take care of yourself. Being able to recognize the signs of caregiver burnout will help you take steps to avoid it and allow you to provide the best care possible on both the good days and bad. 
be sure to subscribe and watch our other videos for additional caregiver support and resources. Um, the reason why I wanted to incorporate this video is to kind of round up <coughs> all of the concepts that we have shared today. And some of us are auditory learners, right? We learn by hearing, but some of us are very visual, okay? So maybe something that you catch up in that video, you lost in the conversation or we didn't even say it, boom, it sticks with you. So I think it's important to resource to different ways of learning too. It's not just listening, right? It's looking, it's uh, integrating knowledge in different ways. So another video I'd like to briefly <laughs> share with you um, is about the challenge of caregiving. And this little video gives you a very particular strategy um, to deal with caregiving. So I think it's important for us to have in this conversation. To become a caregiver, it's because someone you care about has lost some skills and abilities and you step in and you take over, which means you are not only managing all of the things you managed in your own life, but you've had to take on some things that they used to be able to do and you probably had to learn some new skills. And as your care receiver experiences ongoing losses, it will not be unusual for them to get depressed. So how do you maintain your own emotional balance? How do you stay up when your care receiver is down? Well, it's tricky. And we have to understand that all of the things that you are doing to take care of them physically, in addition to trying to keep yourself and them pumped up, is exhausting. So what I would like for you to consider is making your own self-care your number one priority. Now, I understand that this is counterintuitive for most caregivers because you're thinking most of the time about meeting their needs. But just for this one situation, I want you to put yourself first. And we're going to go through the three steps of developing an attitude of creative indifference. And I want you to sit down with a pad and um, a pen or go to your computer and write about what you are feeling, what you need, what you believe has to change in order for you to maintain your own emotional balance. And I think that acceptance is the most difficult part of caregiving because we have to accept that as this situation progresses, um, your care receiver is going to experience some losses and both of you are going to have periods of time when you get down. So what can you do? What are the action steps? Number one is as a caregiver, you need to make your own health a priority. In one letter that my mother wrote to me, she said, well, I decided last night that I will be of absolutely no use to Quentin if I end up in the hospital or the morgue. So this morning, I called the doctor and I made an appointment and I'm going to see him next week. Please follow Madeline's lead. If you feel like there's something going on with you physically that needs attention, get it taken care of. And then I would like for you to sit down and make a list of the types of activities that have reduced your stress and brought you joy in the past. For my mother, it was sitting up and reading a book at night. For me, my, my go-to endorphin booster has always been getting out in nature and going for a walk. For my daughter, it's always been uh, spending time with her dogs and, and, and playing with the dogs and going walking and running with them. Music is almost magical uh, for most people especially for people who have Alzheimer's or dementia. If they are in a down mood, uplifting music um, can, really, can really alter their attitudes and it can alter yours as well. And if you can incorporate exercise into that, that's, that's a guaranteed endorphin booster. So dancing, if you don't like push-ups or sit-ups, uh, is a great way to burn energy and lift your spirits. If your partner um, has Parkinson's, getting them to dance is not only great physical therapy, 
it will also lift their spirits. Meditation, deep breathing can help you relax and release tension. And if you've been feeling cooped up, um, this might be a great time to get a different perspective by getting in the car, going for a drive. Maybe you just look at the scenery or perhaps you stop and treat yourself to an ice cream cone or maybe a fancy cup of coffee. Call a friend who will be empathetic and who will listen to you without judgment. Get involved in a caregiver support group. It's a safe place for you to go to express your feelings and your frustrations and your needs without anybody criticizing you or thinking, um, thinking harshly about you when you're, when you're honest. And then finally, I believe each and every one of us has the most important tool within us, and that is our ability to control our thinking. My mother's mantra was, as long as I have the ability to think and reason, I will have the power to choose my attitude toward any person, situation, or event. And the one thing I want you to take away from this today is self-care is not selfish. It may be the most generous gift you will ever give to your care receiver. Monica, that's that's so beautiful. That just kind of says it all in in a way. We've got maybe just two or three minutes. How how what what final thoughts would you like to share with us? Hmm. Get in touch with yourselves. Have purpose and direction. Connect with your spirits, and trust that you can do and will be doing your best. If I were to put it in a nutshell. Great. And, and if we have time, I don't know if we have. Yes, you had the pan pandemic prayers that you wanted to exactly, end with. Exactly, exactly. Be That'd be beautiful. So, okay, so there are two ways of doing this. I have the thing that I can read, or if I have two minutes to look on YouTube, she does it with a piano accompaniment that is beautiful. But I don't know if I can find it. So it depends on you. You just tell me however you want to go. Why don't you you read just a, a few of them if if yes. that's uh, okay? Yeah. Absolutely. May we greet the sun each morning and rejoice in being alive. May we breathe the miracle of fresh air. May we honor every moment as a chance to begin anew. May we root our faith in richer soil than worry. May we let separation knit us close. May we see faces besides our own in the mirror. May we recognize all people as kin. May we cherish them as much as ourselves. May we stay home to keep them safe. May we nurture the body that houses our soul. May we have adequate shelter, food, water, medicine, and rest. May we share freely from our abundance. May we resist the temptation to hoard. May we ask for help without hesitation or shame. May we draw comfort from the company of animals, flowers, and trees. May we befriend the sounds of silence. May we welcome the intimacies of solitude. May we dive the depth of our being and bring up blessings we didn't know we had. May we be sanctuary for one another. May we refuse to dwell in the blindness of denial indifference or contempt. May we tame our temper and carry no grudge. May we empathize, empathize another with radical attention. May we listen to one another as if lives depend on it. May we speak as if our voice will be the last sound we ever heard. May we explore how to touch without touching. 
how to hold without holding. May we not be embarrassed by tears and trembling. May we learn from our children the joy of unstructured time and the solace of routines. May we reassure our children about the monsters beneath their beds. May we create new rituals of togetherness. May we laugh from our bellies. May we, we can cultivate wonder. Amen. Amen. Uh, Monica Gilo Chartrand, thank you so much for being the, the presenter for our very first Impact 75 Vital Conversations. Uh, and you have, you have presented a way forward for people uh, in theory and in practice who might be feeling overwhelmed by the need for being caregivers for their parents. And this is exactly what we were hoping to achieve tonight. So okay. I thank you. I thank you so much for your warm presence and your information and your knowledge and wish you well in everything. So for everyone else, thank you for joining us for this initial presentation in Impact 75. Um, you can always find this uh, on our church's YouTube page. Be well, good night.